standard version, so uh, if you're looking at the Pew Bible, I'm assuming that it probably is the NIV uh, or another version, You'll, there'll be slight, slight differences in the wording, but uh, here we go. Matthew 22, beginning with verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they, the Pharisees, came together and one of them, a lawyer, asked Jesus a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, depend all the law and the prophets. Would you please bow with me as I, uh, as I pray? Heavenly Father, I am so grateful for the privilege of being able to stand before this group of sisters and brothers, honored that Pastor Dan would give me this privilege and appreciative of all the prayers that have been offered on my behalf this morning as I present your word, I pray that I would simply be faithful to you and that 
the voice that we hear speaking in our own hearts and minds would be the voice, your voice, speaking to each of us, mine, first of all. So we'll thank you for what you do as I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 119, uh, verse 11, is a, a verse that I learned long ago when I was helping children with release time. It says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And over the years, I've, uh, I've memorized a lot of scripture, a lot of scripture. And uh, I confess that uh, if I don't keep going over it, I forget the wording. I don't forget the essence, but I forget the wording. But when we've hidden God's word in our heart, when we need it, it comes forward. Psalm 117 is the shortest, sermon, shortest psalm, and it's interesting. It's just two, two psalms before the longest. And uh, if I can uh, do this correctly, Psalm 117 says something like this. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him. In other words, lavishly praise him, all people. For great is the steadfast love of the Lord toward us. And his faithfulness endures forever. Praise the Lord. The steadfast love of God. I mean, there's probably books that can be, have been written about this. I'm going to try to summarize it in just a few words. So much more could be said about it. But the steadfast love of God, God's love is complete. Whatever that means, it's complete. It has nothing to do with anything that we do. He just loves us. It isn't anything that we deserve. We can't earn it. It doesn't change. There are no boundaries to it. And it lasts forever. And all those things and more are true, whether we understand them or not. It's just the way it is. Some 42 years ago, a young man from a church in Reading went to visit a woman in the hospital at the Reading Hospital. This was a woman who had had repeated hospitalizations and because of the nature of her illness was generally hospitalized on the same floor and so she was acquainted with the nursing staff. This young man went to visit this woman and as they were visiting she said to him, uh, there's a lovely young nurse that is here today and she you might be someone that you would be interested in meeting. And so lo and behold, this young woman came in, the nurse. The patient introduced her to the young man. And uh, when she left, this woman said, uh, you think she might be someone that you'd enjoy going out with? And the young man said, yeah, looks like it. So uh, the woman gave, got permission from the nurse to give her phone number to the young man. The note was sent, the young man received the note, he made the phone call, and uh, in October, Jackie and I will have been married 42 years. <laughs> uh, we met in May, we got married in October, we were engaged in July. Uh, I always say the same thing. I've done marital counseling more times than I can remember. I don't recommend that. We didn't really know one another when we got married, but it worked out for us. I fell in love with Jackie, not because of anything that she did, just because of who she is. We have three daughters. We have eight grandchildren. We love them all. Not because of anything they do, just because of who they are. And what I want you to know today is that we can know our Heavenly Father as a result of knowing Jesus. We get acquainted with the Father by getting acquainted with the Son. Jesus said something like this. It's recorded in Matthew chapter 11. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Those are the prefessorial words to these familiar words. 
No one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And who does the Son choose to reveal? The Father too. He says, come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. All of us carry burdens. We are the ones to whom Jesus wants to reveal the Father. And the Father wants us to know him because he wants us to fall in love with him. He wants to be our first love just because of who he is. And Jesus, interestingly enough, has been very emphatic. He said, the person who loves the fa father or mother more than me isn't worthy of me. The person who loves son or daughter more than me isn't worthy of me. I've said to Jackie already, I hope that I love Jesus more than I love you. And she says, well, you better. <laughs> As you know, after years of comfort in the land of Egypt, the Israelites became slaves after a new Pharaoh came to the throne. And the Israelites became overwhelmed by hopelessness. And then father sought out Moses who was tending the flocks of his father-in-law in the wilderness. And he called Moses to task and through Moses, Father offered magnificent protection for his people in Egypt throughout 10 plagues, especially plague number 10, which was the death of the firstborn. Father God delivered the people of Israel from the mighty Egyptian army as the Israelites fled Egypt. He provided safe passage through that divided Red Sea. He provided miraculous food miraculously in the form of manna, as you know, in the, in the morning. And every evening he provided meat in the form of quail. He did this for millions of people and herds and flocks for years. He provided refreshing fresh water in the desert. He provided the people with shoes that didn't wear out. You remember reading that? And yet, what a bunch of whiners they were. Every single time there was an issue that they would confront, their first impulse was to complain. Because you see, they professed their faith in God, but they didn't possess their faith in God. Now, lest I mislead you, that is a quote from somebody smarter than me. But it's worthwhile remembering they professed a faith in God, but they didn't possess it. They loved God because of what he could do for them. When Father only wanted them to love him. Unless we'd be too critical of the people of Israel, we tend to be whiners too, if you're like me. We have blessing after blessing after blessing after blessing, all coming from God, God providing for us in all kinds of ways, and then we have a hiccup and we wonder why, why me, whatever. Father wants us to just love him. He wants us to fall in love with him. He wants us to make him our first love. It's what faith is all about, falling in love with Jesus. Now Hebrews chapter one says that faith is the what does it say? Faith is the assurance of things that we hope for, the conviction or being convinced of things that we can't see. That's a nice definition, but more simply put, Jesus just wants us to fall in love with him. It's the key to experiencing life in a way that we've never experienced it before. I have a friend who's now 90 years old. He spent his entire life as an artist, primarily a cartoonist interestingly enough. I spoke with him on Friday. He's now in a personal care facility, still drawing cartoons and working on a book. And he said, I just was inspired to write, to draw three more strips. One of them is about our 30th president. 
I said, who, is our, who was our 30th president? He said, I'm glad you asked that. I couldn't remember who the 30th president is. The 30th president was Calvin Coolidge. However, it reminded me of a story about Calvin Coolidge. Calvin Coolidge served as our president from 1923 until 1929. Now, if you do the math, that's six years. He was the vice president for Warren Harding, who died two years into his presidency. And so Cal Coolidge served the remainder of Harding's term and then was elected himself. Cal Coolidge's own son died in 1924 when he was in the White House. Cal was known for his few words. Not too many politicians are known for their few words. Certainly no ministers are known for their few words, but Cal was, and he went to church one Sunday morning and he went by himself. When he came home, his wife asked him what the sermon was about. Cal said it was about adultery. That's it. She said, well, what did he have to say about it? He said, the minister's against it. <laughs> I submit to you this morning that we are committing spiritual adultery if we claim to love the Lord, but really love people or our hobbies or our recreational activities or our stuff or whatever more than Jesus. Our Father is a jealous God. He's jealous of our relationships with him. He's jealous because he wants us to be in love with him. He wants to have a loving relationship with us but he is jealous for us because he knows how much better our lives are when we're close to him than they are when we are not. He longs for our love. He cherishes us to, to be close to him. In Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, you'll remember these words. Moses quoting father. He says, I, the Lord your God, am one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. One day, centuries later, to test Jesus, a Jewish lawyer asked him to recite the greatest commandment. And what did Jesus say? This is the greatest commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might, or some versions of the scripture like mine say mind. But then Jesus added, there's a second commandment that's intimately related to the first. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. God's primary interest is personal relationships. He's interested in our relationship with him. He enjoys his relationship with us I like what Randy Alcorn stated in his book, Heaven, which by the way, if you have not read that epic book, it's 475 pages or something like that, you really need to. But Randy Alcorn says that Jesus loved us so much that he paid the ultimate price just so he could have us over to his place for eternity. Don't you love that? He paid the ultimate price just so he could have us over to his place for eternity. God's concerned about his relationship with us, our relationship with him. He's interested in our relationship with others. That's why this whole COVID thing has been so difficult for the church. We have been, we're, it's built into us, especially as God's people, to be together. And this virus is keeping us apart. And Jesus is concerned with the relationship of other people with him. Now, I'm going to make a statement that you may disagree with, but I want you to think about it. Relationships are more important to our Heavenly Father than accomplishments. When we read obituaries, and the older I get, the more often I read them, and the more completely I read them, most obituaries have the whole list of, of, of accomplishments. And some of them are really interesting, aren't they, since the... Uh, you can write your own obituaries these days. But I believe when we get to heaven, 
God is going to be celebrating our accomplishments because he gives us the gifts to do the things that we do. But what's going to be most important to him is the relationships that we have had. Ours with him, his with us, our relationships with other people and so forth. And that brings me to a pivotal point in this message. A couple of months ago, I had a real difficult conversation with the Lord. He challenged me to love a couple of our neighbors that I find very difficult to love. And he kept saying, do it, do it, do it. And finally I told him, I can't. I cannot love them in the way that you want me to. And after a long pause, he said, no, Steve, you can't. Not until you really love me, not until I'm your first love and you see other people around you, everyone around you, through the lenses of my eyes. As a result of this COVID pandemic and all the social unrest that we're experiencing in our cities in recent months, and as a result of something that I think we hear much less about, geopolitical issues around the world, don't think for an instant our enemies around the world are not paying attention to how preoccupied we are with this COVID virus. But as a result of these kinds of things, there are lots of people around us, as you know, who are afraid. There are people who feel helpless, they feel hopeless, they feel isolated, they feel frustrated, and there are a lot of people who are angry. And they need Jesus, whether they know it or not. And the more I talk to people, the more I'm hearing fellow believers say, I wonder whether we're entering into the end times. We had breakfast with a couple on Monday morning. That's exactly what came up in conversation. I think we're entering into end times. People are expressing hope that, that Jesus is going to return soon. The rapture of the church. The problem is far too many people, including too many people that we love, including members of my own family, would be left behind if Jesus returned anytime soon. Jesus said, much is required of those of us to whom much has been given. And when we think of that, we generally think of the blessings of the material things that we enjoy, don't we? We have our homes, we have all the possessions and so forth, whatever we have. But Father God has given us so much more. He has forgiven our sins. He's given us the promise of eternal life if we've invited Jesus to be our Savior. And all he really wants from us is for us to love others and to love him. It sounds kind of ridiculously simple, doesn't it? Over the years that I've been in ministry, I've been surprised by the numbers of people, and I think particularly early on in my ministry, the numbers of people who were up in years who weren't sure about their salvation. I came across a woman like this back in the early 90s. At that time, she was up in her upper 80s. And uh, when I would visit her, she would say just about every time, she said, my time is short at best. And one day we talked about that and, and realizing that she wasn't confident about her salvation, we were able to pray and she accepted Jesus as her savior. Can you imagine? She was baptized in the Evangelical and Reformed Church. She was confirmed in the Evangelical and Reformed Church. She attended the Evangelical and Reformed Church and then the United Church of Christ all of her life. And at the end of her life, she wasn't sure about her salvation. 
someone had dropped the ball. She hadn't, she hadn't gotten the message. She hadn't made the decision. But what I want us to think about this morning is that it's very likely that time is short for all of us. But there are lots of people for whose love Jesus is still longing. And Jesus has certainly challenged me to think about my love for him and my love for the people around me. And all I want to do this morning is to ask you how much you love Jesus, really. It's a question that only you can answer. But other people's relationships with Jesus, people like my neighbors, I'm not asking you to come down and witness to them, but other people's relationships with Jesus may hinge on the love for him that they see in us, me and you. And so I'm just going to invite you to bow with me this morning as we conclude in prayer. Lord Jesus, we ask for your forgiveness if we have been loving other people or things more than we really love you. And we can kind of gauge the depth of our relationships with you by the amount of time that we spend in your word and with you in prayer, leading on you, depending on you. But we want to do better. And I would pray, Lord Jesus, that if by any chance there would be anyone here in this gathering this morning who hasn't invited you to be their savior, that they would do just that. You, you tell us that you stand at the door of, of our hearts and knock, and all we need to do is ask, and, and you'll enter. But I also ask, Lord Jesus, that making you our first love, that you would use us effectively in our witness, giving us the strength to overcome despondency and discouragement and leaning on you in the midst of the trials that we encounter in life, even the ones that seem to be overwhelming. That either by the witness of our word and or the witness of our lives as we live them, that other people would be drawn to you as though to the true light. And for all of it, we'll give you the glory and the praise. Praying as always in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus. Amen.